Well, regular ADH TV viewers will be familiar with my next guest, fellow host, Fred Paul. Here's a look at some of his work. The only source for these numbers is Hamas, who are better known for raping women than they are for their skills with mathematics and statistics. Our medical industry wants to make us sick and our schools and universities want to make us stupid. They had a chance to stand up for us when our governments went totalitarian on us during the pandemic, and they failed. I wouldn't trust him to run a plant-based hamburger stand at the Woodford Folk Festival. Grab your ATM card, withdraw some cash, and use it to buy whatever the hell you want. And here is the government's official response to those alarming concerns. Well, that's just a taste of uh, my next guest and some of the issues that he's been delving into. But one of his most recent projects has been researching the digital ID bill, which quietly passed the Senate last week. Few politicians spoke out against it. There was very little debate. One senator who did speak was One Nation's Malcolm Roberts. Here he is. The reality is this is the most significant legislation I've seen in my time in the Senate. It's the glue that holds together the digital control agenda by which every Australian will be controlled, corralled, exploited and then gagged when they speak or act in opposition. This bill will be misused because this bill is written to be misused. Well, Fred joins me now, and uh, this is obviously a very controversial issue, and I want to unpack this. Uh, Fred, welcome. Why should we be concerned about a digital ID bill? Well, the way this has been done, Lyle, has alarm bells ringing loud and clear. That legislation was presented to the senators four days before it was presented to the Senate itself. Uh, it's pretty complex legislation, so there's not... You know, they didn't have enough time to debate it. But also, look at the strategy. They're taking it to the Senate first. Mm. Normally, the most robust debate is in the House of Representatives. Had it gone to the reps first, some of the crossbench senators might have been spooked. They might have been alarmed or their concerns. They would have had, uh, you know, the, the concerns raised before them. Instead, it's gone to the Senate. Who knows what backroom deals were done, uh, horse trading legislation, uh, to get this through. Now the government has got it through the Senate, which is the difficult part. It'll sail through the reps and the next thing you know, we are on our way to a social credit system like China. This legislation moves us closer to China and away from Liberal democracy. Well, let's just unpack it a bit more. Um, there's a bit of history behind this. Um, as you say, went through the Senate, very little debate. Uh, irregular sort of process, but this was actually originally cooked up, uh, not by Labor and the Greens, but by the coalition under the then uh, Morrison government minister, uh, Stuart Robert. Yeah, and that's why, uh, you know, Senator Alex Antich from South Australia is the outlier here. A lot of the Liberals just ignored this because, as you say, if they criticised it, they'd be accused of hypocrisy. And the suggestion there, or the... the the, the conclusion there for people like you and I, Lyle, is that this is an, more evidence of the Uniparty, mm. you know, both sides of, of politics in Australia taking their orders from the same globalist agenda, whoever that is. Well, well that, that's right. I mean, obviously, this is something that has come probably through the bureaucracy. Uh, the, the coalition carried it first. Um, change of government doesn't matter. It's a uniparty agenda. Um, it does seem to have globalism all over it. Fred, tell us, what actually is a digital ID? Well, I mean, it, it's been introduced by stealth already because if you are a direct... A lot of viewers will be familiar with this. If you're a director of a company or mm. uh, own a self-managed super fund, then you've been told, get yourself a digital ID, and you've probably already done it. I have. I'm a director mm. of my own company. So th this has already been introduced probably among a cohort that is probably more likely to comply than most people because people in companies are just looking for efficient, uh, you know, outcomes and efficient ways to use government services. Um, that is how it's being sold to the populace. This is going to make life more convenient for you. And the next cohort will be welfare recipients. Once this legislation has passed through, 
people who who are on the dole or you know need some sort of help from the government, which these days Lyle is most Australians. So they'll you know they'll be told you're not going to get the dole unless you uh, upload your um, all your digital all your data and your biometric details. Mm -hmm. Well, well, it's interesting, Fred, because um, look, we all want convenience and we, we know that the digital revolution provides all of that. We don't want dodgy people running companies. I, I think I've actually done the same as you and, and given digital information or got some sort of a digital ID to be a director of a company. I've got one of these e-passports which are great in transiting through airports. Um, so on, on one hand there's a lot of security. We don't want people on welfare ripping off the system so there needs to be some way to validate someone's identity. Why not do it digitally? Well, it's being sold to us as convenience, but the negatives are being completely obscured and that's why the government and the, even, even the opposition don't want this debated properly in Parliament. The, lead, the main concern, Lyle, is security. I mean, I spoke to a, a worldwide... I had him on my show, a worldwide, a world-renowned... Uh, cyber security expert from New York uh, last year and he told me, I've never forgotten it, he told me there isn't a computer system in the world that hasn't either already been hacked or will be hacked. Mm. So all our, our, our biometric data, all our details, private details, are going to be stored by the Australian government. How can we rely on the Australian government to keep that information secure? We, si we just simply can't. Mm. So w when you're talking about biometrics, that's like fingerprints um, that possibly... Yeah, your face. It's essentially fa your face. Fa facial, so, facial and, recognition. And, uh, yeah, yeah, and this, this, is where mm. it this is where it gets really sinister and uh, I'm more than happy to go down this rabbit hole mm. because the, the Chinese government mm. has that biometric they data do. and uses it. They have literally hundreds of millions of cameras all over China making sure that they follow their citizens wherever they go. Now, would the Australian government do use, misuse this information? At the moment, we are told to upload the information because it will be convenient for us and it will make government services run more efficiently. But can we trust the government to draw the line there? In fact, we cannot. It's absolutely beyond doubt since COVID that we can't trust the government to work in our interests. It is... You know, they're working against us. They will lock us down for spurious reasons if they feel the need. Now, the other, uh, the other half to this, Lyle, which we haven't got to yet, is the central bank digital currency. Mm. This will mm. be combined. That's another government program that's going on in the background without us knowing, without us ever being consulted, and it will be introduced, just like digital IDs. It will be introduced. Both sides of parliament, both sides of, uh, of uh, politics agree, and you combine these two things and you will have a totalitarian country. Yeah, we certainly don't want that. Um, I, I guess um, th this issue of trust is, is a big one and that has been very much shattered through COVID. We were told uh, the, the vaccine and look, I was someone who chose to get vaccinated. I might have taken a different uh, decision in hindsight now, but we were told it was voluntary. Clearly it wasn't. When uh, during the digital ID debate last week, I heard spokespeople from the Albanese government saying, well, it's not going to be compulsory to have a digital ID. I thought, well, we've heard that before. And uh, this is something very sensitive, as you say, with our data. Um, what will happen if someone decides that they don't want to get a digital ID, will they be disadvantaged in the same way as non-vaccinated people were during the COVID period? Clearly they will, Lyle. I mean, this is... That's, that's, that's what the government... How the government has behaved already. So, you know, people will be told either you comply with this digital ID and, later on, a central bank digital currency, or you, just, you simply become a second-class citizen. That's yeah. what happened during COVID. You can't and, go to the pub. And, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with a central bank digital currency, it's a programmable currency, mm. so you can't just go, here's $20, I'm going to spend it on, you know, on beer or a vegetarian hamburger. The government will step in and say, OK, you're not going to spend it on beer because you've already had... You know, you've already bought a slab this week and uh, that's too much. Or, or, or could they say you're not going to buy, you know, one of those V8 utes because um, <laughs> exactly. we've got a climate agenda and a planet yep. to save. Um, yep. so, 
I mean, that, that does sound, you know, very conspiratorial. And I must admit, you know, Malcolm Roberts' grab that we played at the top of this segment uh, about control, you know, it could be seen as this vast right-wing conspiracy. Um, but um, we, we, I guess we, we can't just wave this through and, and not worry about where this might take us. I mean, essentially, it gives the government control over our lives and the ability to control whether we have access to, to money or to... Um, services, as you say. Uh, well, is, 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 there, is there a way to make this safe uh, from the sort of concerns that uh, we're talking about today and that Malcolm Roberts was raised? Well, Lyle, if it was safe and if it was in our, our interests, then they wouldn't be afraid of debating it. Mm. And it's the same with yeah. the central bank digital currency. The Reserve Bank of Australia has already conducted 15 real-life trials of a central bank digital currency. Nobody knows that. That's been... Kept, that's been swept under the carpet and, and it will eventually become a fait accompli. Now, combine it with another totalitarian uh, 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 item on the agenda, which is, which is the misinformation and disinformation yeah. bill. I mean, this, all, this, all these policies reveal the true character of Australian politics at the moment. And they're frightening signs. As I said earlier, we are heading, we are becoming more like China and less like Great Britain and the United States. Mm. Well, well, Fred, if people want to know more about this, um, the digital currency and the, uh, the uh, digital ID bill, I know you've done some work for ADH TV. Where can they go to find that? Well, just follow me on, on Twitter, at Fred Paul, or also follow Malcolm Roberts, uh, on uh, on various social media platforms and Alex Antich and Ralph Babbitt, for that matter, from yep. the UAP down in Victoria. They're three really good uh, uh, politicians who are fighting against this. But um, at this stage, Lyle, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it, it looks like a losing fight, I've got to mm. say. I think these things will be introduced and Australia will be a worse country as a result. Yeah, look, like you, Fred, I don't, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but when there's a lack of debate and uh, it's all silent, it's being rushed through. Um, this now goes to the House of Reps. As you mentioned earlier, this is um, not the normal way that legislation is done. Yes, bills can be introduced into the Senate, but it's very rare. It normally goes into the lower house, which is the chamber of government. Uh, but this will just sail through because uh, the Albanese government has a majority there and it doesn't seem like the uh, coalition is, is willing to debate this in any way, shape or form. No, no, they're not. And in fact, some of the key coalition senators were absent for the debate, in the, for, for the vote in the Senate. I mean, they just let it sail through there. So there is very little appetite for a fight over this, except from One Nation and UAP and, mm. God bless him, Alex Antich. Yeah. So when is this likely to go back to Parliament? We've got the budget sitting next in May. Uh, presumably it'll be sometime after that, perhaps after the winter recess. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's on the agenda for this year and mm. I imagine the, the government's in a hurry to, to get it through. So, yeah, it will it could be by the end of this year. But, but I've got, as I said, it's, it's already been introduced by stealth anyway. I mean, yeah. company directors have all signed up. Mm. So, um, you know, it, it will be... These, these are the way governments do things these days, is they introduce them by increments mm. and then suddenly they normalise. Uh, that's a word you hear often these days, Lyle. It make, yeah. makes me uncomfortable. We're always being told to... To accept things being normalised, and it's always things that we didn't want or weren't asked for. Exactly, and we haven't been asked about this. Um, there needs to be far more debate. Uh, Fred, thanks very much for bringing this to our attention, and uh, let's keep uh, this in uh, the, to the fore uh, amongst our viewers, and hopefully try and get a wider public debate before this does go through the parliament. Uh, Fred, thanks very much for your time today. Pleasure, thanks, Lyle.